So um, we have been at this for 12 years now. And I personally feel we're just scratching the surface. We're just in the beginning. And uh, today, we're the top grossing language learning app in the world. Um, millions of paying subscribers, 750 people here in Berlin and in our offices in New York. And we all think we're doing something important, something that really matters. And that's what I'm talking about today. I want to make a strong case that language learning makes your life better and even more so than you might think. So let's start with Homer. In Homeric poetry, there's a word that doesn't make a single appearance. Well, there's many words in Homer that don't make a single appearance, like garbage track or cell phone or microprocessor. But one word you would expect, since the Odyssey is set on water to a large degree. And what would you expect for something on water? Blue. The word blue. But the word blue is not appearing in the Odyssey at all. How's that possible? Homer uses different ways to describe the ocean, um, often calling it wine dark or wine faced, which is kind of weird, right? Uh, but there's no blue ocean in, in Homer. And how could that be? How could the ocean look like wine? Because Homer was a blind poet? Mm, probably not. Uh, nobody at that time could probably really tell the difference. And how did that work? Because in ancient Greek, there wasn't a word for blue. And that in itself is not extremely astonishing, because in the development of languages, uh, words for color come in rather late, because they're a bit more abstract than they might appear to us. Um, and without the language, it's very, very hard for us to process visual or, or a sensory input. Um, so we, we actually need the, the language to represent uh, what, we are, what we're experiencing. And everybody who has been into the intricacies of wine tasting actually knows that. Once you know how, how to call these tastes, you're actually able to tell two wines apart that otherwise might look very similar. And the other way around, and going back to Homer, if you don't know how to say blue, if you don't know the concept for blue, then the ocean might even look like wine. So language is a key component in our uh, cogn cognitive process. And it's not only about tastes and colors. Um, it is really a centerpiece in how our mind processes things. Um, and we don't really have to go back to ancient Greece or to Aboriginal languages where there's no left and right, and I have a southern arm and a northern arm or a western arm, whatever. Um, we don't have to go there. We could just look at uh, English that, uh, uh, a language that's closer to us, like English. So uh, English as a language encourages us to think about us and speak about us and ourselves and our being. I am tired. I am hungry. I am right. In Spanish, that's a bit different. Um, because tiredness is not something that I am, it's more something that I have. And just note that there's the, the personal pronoun is kind of more implicit. Tengo sueño, tengo hambre, tengo razón. Right? And in Arabic, the concept of having something is not even very easy to, to, uh, um, uh, com to bring across. It's usually done by, by um, the word order of, of nouns, like kitab il bint, the girl's book. No concept of possession in there, very strong, just a uh, positioning of words. But all these things are just different ways of saying things, right? It's just the same reality we're talking about. Um, 
Yes, absolutely. The sensory input, absolutely the same. The reality doesn't change. But the way we experience the world is very much through language. And having more than one language gives us choices. And these choices do change us. They make a difference. And these differences go really, really deep. So let's explore that a bit. Bilingualism, speaking two languages, was for a long time seen as a problem and a hindrance. That was very long still so in, for instance, schools that dealt with migrant children. Uh, for a very long time, parents were, who, who ca had different uh, mother languages were encouraged to s select one language to speak to their kid, to not mess up primary language acquisition because that would confuse kids. We know today that this is not true. We know today that speaking more than one language makes you smarter and helps you to focus better. And in both, in the warning against bilingualism in children and the benefits this has, there's one key concept, and that is linguistic interference. So if I'm able to say or represent stuff in two different ways, then these two different representations in my cognitive process are kind of competing to be selected. And that is a constant effort that I have to, oops, to select the right slide, no, to select the right uh, um, concept to, and, and the right representation. For people who are bilingual, that never really is something that pops up as a problem. Um, it becomes, like other things that are high effort and that we do it often, it becomes more automatic. Uh, and only if we're kind of intoxicated or tired or when we're under viel stress and on nicht so genau wissen, then, uh, sorry, if we're under stress and we're in a situation where we might be under pressure, then uh, we still might mi uh, mix up languages. But usually we don't. But even if we don't see that effort, if we don't see that effort, um, it makes a difference. It trains our brains. Um, and especially what we call executive functions. And that is directing our attention, selecting input, and making sure that we focus on what's important and what not. Making decisions, making choices. That's what measurably gets better when you speak multiple languages. Because your brain is constantly making these choices, and these processes are constantly going on, even if you don't, don't recognize them. And if you go a little deeper to understand this, then probably you know that um, our, our brains have two kinds of tissues. There, there's gray matter and white matter. And gray matter is where the cell bodies and neurons are, uh, and the dendrites. And uh, that's where the, if you want, the processing happens. And that gray matter can be more or less dense. And while the number of cell bodies doesn't change really strongly, uh, and if so, rather for the negative, um, the connections between them, uh, dendrites and especially synapses, um, they might increase. And in bilinguals, they do increase uh, over time. And that means that you basically have more processing power in your brain. You have more synapses to work with. And it's not only that, it's also that the synapses are not constant forever. They do change. Uh, there's new connections forming. That's called neuroplasticity. That's also better if you speak two languages. And that's an ability that helps us to adapt. That's basically learning. So neuroplasticity translates into the ease of how, how we can learn stuff, how we can change, how we can adapt. Makes a pretty big difference. And that's not even all. Because as I said, there's also white matter. And while the gray matter is where kind of the processing happens. Um, white matter is the where, where the signals travel. It's uh, uh, basically axons and, and myelin. Uh, and and uh, everyone who's um, ever worked with the internet knows, knows connection matter. And everybody who looked at um, internet routing, you know that redundancy matters, different ways of connecting stuff. And um, in bilingual people, the integrity of white matter is, is higher 
and that gives, gives signals more choices to travel. It's a bit like if our heads were cities, then monolingual people would have, say, a sub subway in their head, um, and bilingual people would have a subway and a bus system, so that if the center line is out of service for just a second, which happens actually, um, then you st can still jump, hop on a bus and you still get there. So your signal can, can still travel from one area of processing to another. So that again helps you um, by being bilingual. Now, that's a lot of, lot of benefits, right? So our attention is, gets stronger and more focused. We get better at decision taking. Um, processing is better, signal uh, um, transmission is better, and there's knock-on effects of those. So um, if, if you're bilingual, your risk of uh, um, getting dementia uh, um, is lower, um, age-related depression is, is uh, uh, rare, and uh, um, that basically means that Speaking more than one language makes you smarter, faster, better learning, and keeps your mind younger for longer. So, what if you're not bilingual? <laughs> well, um, there's, there's also good news, and that is that language learning itself seems to have very similar benefits. If you ever started even learning a language, you know these moments, these moments where this rather newly learned Spanish way of saying stuff seems more appropriate for this situation, or where, where just the French word of what you'd see pops into mind, or this odd English word that jumps into your freshly learned German sentence. That's linguistic interference. That's where you see that sim similar things happen than in, in bilingual brains. The training effect there seems to be very, very similar. And it's not so much about how the proficiency is, how well you speak your second or third language, but that you engage with it. The time you engage with the language is what makes the difference. Now, how long does this take to, to kick in? Can we see a difference after three months? And how does it compare to, say, using a brain training app? Well, uh, this is uh, basically a cliffhanger because I don't know. I don't know yet. Um, it's research that's still ongoing. We teamed up with the University of Sheffield to find out exactly that. So we set up three test groups, one who just keeps on living their monolingual life, uh, one uh, that uses a brain training app, and the third that learns a new language with Babel. And after three months, we're comparing ex especially the executive functions of these three groups and see if something changes. And Babel provides the, uh, of course, the language learning experience and the linguistic experience, and the University of Sheffield provides the, the cog uh, cognitive and, and, the, uh, and neuro, uh, uh, neuroscience uh, uh, expertise and most of the funding. And uh, um, everybody in this research is very excited, but we all pretty much know what the outcome will be. The outcome will be another proof how strongly and quickly language learning makes an impact on your brain. And if you want to know more uh, on this, of course, there should be a minute for questions. Take a picture of this, or rather, email us at research at Babel. We are happy to share the references and also what came out of our research. And uh, it's also a way to reach out in any way. Um, so taken together, a second language or a, an additional language gives you another perspective on the world. It unlocks different ways of representing the world. Um, it also helps you to understand a bit deeper how other people might see the world and how they, how they think. It makes you smarter, it makes you, you be mentally fit for longer, 
Um, so it, there's, there's a lot of things going on for language learning, I think. So at Babel, um, this is our mission. It has these three very important concepts. Everyone can impact a lot of people. Learning and languages. And today I hope I gave you a little more background why we feel this matters. Thank you. Thanks a million, Markus. Uh, very poetic and immersive, uh, easy to absorb uh, yeah, uh, talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm, instead of me this time, I'm going to go to the, to the crowd. Uh, your timing was, was amazing. So do you fear the advancements in live translation? Will people still learn languages, or are we going to get lazy about all of that? <laughs> um, absolutely, I don't fear that. Um, if you ever tried it, it's not the problem that live translation is, is not really working very well, um, but speaking to somebody else through a machine is not a good experience. That's one, number one. Uh, and number two is that we, we are closing into a world where everybody speaks English. So live translation is not the problem. And when I, when I look at motivations for people, uh, why they learn languages. It's pretty much along the line of what I've spoken about and what you said before. Uh, you don't want to watch over the uh, uh, movies all the time. Yeah. You want to actually understand people more and understand how they, how they think and connect to them and have like, just a few words in their language uh, to, to be closer to them. I think that's what matters way more than just translate transmission of information, which, which live translation does. And, and one more question from here, Marcus, um, and it's something I've thought about a lot myself. Do you feel we get similar, is there massive diminishing returns after we go bilingual and we start getting a third and a fourth language? What do you feel about that? No, um, I think what, what you would see is that usually, depending on how different the, the next language is, you have, have a, a strong effect of it becoming easier. Uh, that is because you learn learning a bit more and because of all the, all the uh, um, brain improvements that you, you went through by learning your, your first uh, language, neuroplasticity improves. So, so um, I wouldn't say the, the having three choices is a different category than two. Um, I don't think that returns diminish very quickly. After maybe 10, it, they might, but I don't know a lot of people, even at Babel, who speak more than 10 languages. Okay, uh, amazing talk. Big, warm round of applause, please. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks.